So Mark, I, I love your enthusiasm, and I want to believe, but I'm thinking about Southern California where they have mm -hmm. the water, water wars, and it seems yes. like if you give water to one group, it takes away from the other. It takes away from the and other, if, like if, Cadillac if, Desert. Yeah. If they're putting water in the desert, why isn't it raining more and they're them not having problems? Well, there's, there's some areas of uncertainty about that, to be sure, and uh, uh, the, we know that the Great Basin Range during the Ice Age was a pluvial area. So there, not only was it wet there, there were lakes and enough precipitation to fill those lakes. So I, I, what we need to find out is can we get control on, on the hydrologic cycle and attract more precipitation to the area? And this obviously would benefit California as well in their drought-stricken state, which is now affecting Massachusetts. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I've got a comment okay. on that. Uh, uh, last, we got folks out. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll right over here. We, we, um, I, I was always fascinated by Nevada and the ranchers out there and how could we get more water. And we had ranchers that were doing really good grazing patterns for 20 years. And in the middle of all that, with no wood available at all, in Elko area, which is 10 inches of rainfall a year, the beaver showed up. And what they're experiencing now is a lot of the water in Nevada is dependent on all the mountain ranges. And if they can just get the transpiration going. And when they start back and looking at the history of California and Nevada and whatever, there were tens of millions of beaver in the American West, you know, maybe 100 million. And the water never left. It recycled and recycled and recycled. And, uh, you know, that's, that's another angle on it. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you could always think of it in terms of water economics. And as, as Amory Levins would point out, if you keep the money in the community, this really helps you know, support the community and grow the local economy rather than shipping it out. And, and I think water is similar. If you get a system, a hypertopia, with sufficient local transpiration, it's going to attract more uh, uh, of the hydrologic cycle to that particular spot. And, and this, this is really what we need. We can't afford to build pipelines from the Arctic all over the world, maybe in a few cases, but you know, we really need the planetary energy budget to help us out here and move the water where we need it to go. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to point out that last fall we had a conference called Restoring Water Cycles to Reverse Global Warming, and there are all kinds of ideas about how to do that, and all of those videos are online on our website, so you can go and watch them. We've had 60,000 views wow. so far yeah. of our online videos. What he said. Yeah, Charlotte. So I have a comment to add. Um, I was just in India for two years, and they do a tremendous amount of dry land farming. It's a total other agricultural system. And how they're doing it is by allowing the microbes to live in the soil that hold the water in the soil. And, and because of that, I'm doing a 20-acre project in eastern Oregon where there's 8 to 14 inches of rain a year. Um, and I'm doing a, a food forest, which is an interesting idea because it's agroforestry. So we're actually putting what I call borewell trees, which are alders, deep-rooted trees, mixing in with fruit and nut trees. Um, so it, it just takes care of a whole lot of these things. But what we did in this one year, and all we added, um, uh, in permaculture they'll add uh, like three feet of mulch to get these microbes to grow. And in three years you have a good microbe population. But what I did is I sprayed basically $500 worth of microbes uh, 13 times over my 20 acres. And I now have a huge increase in the carbon in the soil. Um, and a huge increase in the water. And my answer, what I saw in India, was in a 17-acre plot. The rain would actually come to his land. That's why I chose, I'd much rather do a two-acre plot. I chose 20 acres because I wanted to see that the, the rain would actually, that the uh, water cycle in no, that 20 acres would work. So this could be an experiment for that. Yeah. Um, just Sh Charlotte. You're here. Charlotte is a permaculturist. She's had years of experience in permaculture. And I'm wondering, Charlotte, will you give a workshop on Sunday? Sure. 
Okay, so yeah. you can learn more about dryland farming. Um, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian von Herzen from the Climate Foundation. So I love that 1500 example of this little ice age. And I looked it up and it looks like, you, like the actual CO2 dropped by around 10 parts per million in over about 50 years. And let's say that took around a million square kilometers. So I'm very interested to see how that forest example could extrapolate to the modern world where we're looking at 10 parts per million increase in just a few, part, a few years, maybe a decade. Mm -hmm. And the second question I would have is how many more doublings of population can we support, in your opinion, on, on this earth? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, both important questions. Uh, the first one, uh, it, it really depends on how successful the prototype hypertopias are. And I think if it, if it works well, and if indeed uh, attracting the hydrologic cycle is a viable situation, not just for the Great Basin and Range, but for all the other red, red places on that map, I think there's almost no limit to, you know, we, we could actually control this back and forth. Now, in terms of human population size, uh, my calculation suggests that the optimal carrying capacity of planet Earth for Homo sapiens is about 20 billion people, uh, which is, uh, you know, but, but use under these conditions, right, under conditions of proper planetary management. So we're not even halfway there in a sense, but it's all, now it's being managed so poorly that, um, you know, we, we, we shouldn't want to expand the population unless we have it under these proper, more controlled conditions. Any comments on yeah. leaving space for nature? Oh, that leaves plenty of space for nature. I mean, and, and, and integrates us into it. See, that's part of the, the hypersea phenomenon. We, we sort of undergo a symbiosis with the planet using our, uh, our, our uh, uh, mental ability and care for the Earth and goodwill to our other creatures. I, you know, we, we're, we're a needed part of the, pl of the planet now. We, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be our goodwill and our activities and actions that control the fate of the planet. So we might as well get good at it, as Stuart Brand would say. Yeah. For the hypertopia. Um, mm -hmm. Hold on one second. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Just piggybacking off of your comment on um, the little ice age, I was wondering where I could get additional research on um, First Nations slash and burn um, actually affecting uh, the Little Ice Age, because I'm familiar mm -hmm. with it sequestering a lot of carbon, but actually having that effect and was curious. I, I, rec I recommend Thomas Mann's book, uh, 1493. He discusses Charles, that. Charles Mann. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles Mann, thank you. Charles Mann's book, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, 1493. He has, he has a section on that. It's a good book. It is a good book. Well, yeah. we don't have it here. Uh, Mark, yeah. hmm? From a social point of view, mm -hmm. um, how will hypertopia get control of the land? Uh, <clears throat> this has to be economically viable, okay? So it has to be something that you could say, sell to a very conservative administration, and they will see that the bottom that it's it's a, it's black. The bottom line has to be black. So it has to be economically viable. Uh, private ownership. Uh, there's, you know, I think it's going to be less difficult to do than it would be in a more thickly settled area because, you, you know, you have open spaces that, that aren't heavily utilized yeah, for a lot of things. Own people own that, yeah. So clearly there will have to be some uh, inducements to, to get these things set up. And they don't have to be incredibly spacious uh, at, the, at the beginning, but clearly there will have to be, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, steps taken to acquire the land to set up the hypertopia. Uh, and uh, I would really prefer to see that, you know, just through our standard market system rather than some sort of coercive eminent domain seizure of the land. I really think if we can avoid that, we should. Uh, so but yes, it does pose problems. No, that's where everybody yeah. at this conference is listening and looking to become part of the solution by particularly George. in other countries. Microphone. Microphone. Oh, Microphone. Okay. It's, it's vital that we help the planet get to E.O. Wilson's Half Earth and Sylvia Earle's concept of half the oceans being preserved. This country had the first national park in the world. Uh, other islands I work on, Bonaire had one of the first in the whole Caribbean. It's important to help, help this whole process out by protecting as large a number of parcels as we can, not just here but elsewhere. And, and so it's important. If you haven't read Half Earth by E.O. Wilson, it's, it's a great step towards where we're talking about going yeah. today.
Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like what Francis Bacon uh, said about wealth. Money is like muck. It's not much good unless you spread it. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so the water is the same. You know, this this helps distribute it where, where it needs to be. The water's there. We just have to get it where it needs to be. And Mark, uh, Sink it, I'm spread here. it, share it. Hello. Hi. Uh, Benoit Lambert uh, from, from Quebec. Uh, I, I work with Sinks, you know. I, I try to develop a biochar in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm very much with soils and, and sinks and, and mm -hmm. put carbon back in soils. Mm -hmm. But when I hear you talking about, you know, we should mm, not consider that we can get away from fossil fuel, mm -hmm. I, I'm a little disturbed. <laughs> Because, uh, first of all, uh, 20 billion barrels is 200 to 250 days of world consumption. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a bit more than six months of consumption, but that's right. not more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, electric motors are three times more efficient than combustion uh, engine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the hood doesn't get hot, you know, when you have an right. electric car. Right. Um, why would we continue with tar sands and dirty fuel, you know, on indigenous lands in Canada in particular, when we can actually produce locally clean, renewable uh, electricity energy. It, it doesn't make sense at all. I think we have to get away from fossil fuel as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. And it can be done. Yes. Because we went from $3 per kilowatt on, on the solar panels um, in 2010. We're now at 30 cents. And the last contract in uh, Dubai was uh, negotiated at 2.99 cents per kilowatt for 375 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're, we're on, the, on the road to, to uh, clean and, and, and renewable energy. Okay, yeah, thank no, you. I applaud what you say, and I, I'm completely uh, uh, in accordance with the move away from fossil fuels. A couple of things. First of all, to fly a jet airliner, it's going to be a while before we can run that with solar panels or other renewable sources. You, know, you really need that concentrated jet fuel to get the, the, the aircraft in the air. You need that power. Um, also, I, you know, many of the, so, the solar technology, it's being, I, in my opinion, it's being put in the wrong places. You know, I'm, I'm driving on the turnpike and I'm seeing these, you know, kind of attractive solar panels, but they are covering land surface that should have plants on it. So the panels should be on top of the buildings, covering parking lots to help keep the snow off. So we have to be smarter about where we situate, situate these things. Wind power, of course, is a, is a tremendous possibility, but we can't allow it to slice and dice the raptors that fly through the blades. So we need an advanced in technology that puts some kind of framework around the, uh, the, the, the uh, wind power to protect the birds and, and so they're not getting hurt. But yeah, in, in, I'm in accord with what you say. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes. So I would like to ask the symbiosis team if they have any comments on what has transpired in the past few minutes. Um, I would just say that. Uh, and we need. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say your name too. Okay, I'm Annie, and I would just say um, I agree with Jim. In order to get the water to stick on the land, we need more biodiversity on the land, and a lot of this can be attained by reducing our meat consumption and so opening up more free space and more options for stuff that you're doing with um, more, a, a more higher diversity of crops rather than government subsidized corn, soy, wheat, alfalfa. Yeah. Uh, one thing, Anne, I would add to that. Um, the, the, uh, I really uh, approve your idea to move away from the animal protein, but we also, should move away from above ground crops because uh, you know wheat for example has a problem you know it, it, if it gets larger than this the stocks fall over and it, and you can lose the crop very easily but if you have below ground crops like potatoes and so forth this is much more uh, efficient in terms of uh, the agriculture and if you go to uh, South America the number of types of potatoes that they have is incredible it's things you've never seen before but these are all grown below ground, uh, taking advantage of the sheltering earth, so to speak, to grow a ver very nutritious crop without having to have reliance on above ground crops. Yeah. I know I asked you this before. Uh, microphone? Yeah. Um, the presenters have all offered, you know, uh, focusing on this. Hold it, just yell out. So 
Check, check. Hello? <laughs> I, um, I already asked Annie this question, but the presenters have books and articles and uh, websites we can access, and I would be very interested in accessing the information and the research you have done, and I'm wondering if there's any way we can do that. Thank you. Uh, all, all the videos will be online, as will the slideshows. So you can get it that way. You can buy a copy of Mark's book, um, Ediacara, and Hyper C is also available, and he also wrote uh, a remarkable annotated edition of Vladimir Vernadsky's book, Vi Biosphere. Uh, Vernadsky, well, you want to say a little bit oh, yeah. about Vernadsky? I, I, that's, this, it wasn't, uh, I didn't write it, it was a translation of uh, but Vladimir annotated Vernadsky's, it, right? but I annotated the it. Annotations yes. yeah, the annotations are I, I wrote the annotations, yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, and it's, I really recommend that it's uh, Copernicus Press, uh, uh, Vladimir Vernadsky's The Biosphere, in which he, he really uh, uh, explains our modern concept of the biosphere. That's a term that, that was uh, first coined by the great uh, uh, Viennese geologist uh, Edward Zeus. And then Vernadsky takes the biosphere concept, he runs with it, and, and really explains how uh, you know, we, we must see this as an incredible catalytic machine on the surface of the planet that takes sunlight and does all these fantastic things. And, and Bernowski was, was very uh, impressed with life's capabilities. He calls it the pressure of life. I mentioned that in the talk, how life has this explosive uh, uh, capacity. And uh, this, this is in, in a, a little bit in, a, in conflict with uh, Lynn Margulis and Jim, James Lovelock's concept of Gaia, where, where the, the planet is being controlled or thermostatically controlled by life. I think that still is an aspect of it. But we, we have to also account for the, the fact that, that life can throw the system out of whack, so to speak. For instance, at two billion years ago, when we had the oxygen revolution or the oxygen crisis, and organisms were releasing diatomic oxygen, this toxic gas, which killed many, many forms of organisms, presumably, until the superoxide dismutase enzyme was developed that could catch those dangerous molecules. And then it now is an essential fuel or essential part of our metabolism, now the diatomic oxygen. So in other words, for every, every time there's a crisis, because of life pushing and pushing and pushing, there's also an opportunity. And so that's what we represent. We, we're the pressure of life, latest edition. And so, and, and we have, we have a, a, an ability to, um, to modulate our impact and I think really improve the planet if we, if we get on the ball and do this. Okay, Jim has one final comment and then we get a 15 minute break and uh, we have more treats to come. I just, I just wonder, is, is Joe Roman here? All right, um, I, I wanna emphasize the importance in grasslands of big animals and also in the oceans and Joe Roman's here to talk to us about that. And that's, uh, that's a huge thing. We used to have buffalo roaming around, or big animals, even bigger. And uh, that was uh, a nutrient pump. And um, so, you know, I mean, we may get to the point where we're not eating meat out of feedlots, which I totally agree with. But, uh, you know, uh, how are we going to help these grasslands, these des desertified lands that don't have any animals on them anymore? So that's, that's another thing. And I wondered, uh, Linus and Jamila and Hayden, did you have anything to say? About 2061, How, what kind of world do you want? Yeah, I, I like that, 2061. Yeah. I want to congratulate uh, this team for their visions. Yeah. Everybody, could, everybody could have a vision, which would be heading towards good place. Yeah.